All right, hey everybody, it's Chris Kirkpatrick and I am here today uh, with my friend and guest, Galen Nuttall. Now, um, I've been getting, it was funny, I was a couple weeks ago going through my channel. Uh, I get a lot of comments on, uh, on um, well, this is great about the US, but how does this work in Canada? And so it, it kind of stoked me to do some research and I found out that about 14, 15% of uh, the people that watch my videos on personal finance um, are in fact Canadian. And so I just so happened to meet this guy, Galen. Uh, he's a great guy. We've been, we actually met in a mastermind group with a guy named Dana Derricks, who's one of the top internet marketers in the world. Um, and in that time, realized that Galen actually is pretty much doing a lot of the same stuff and has a lot of the same philosophies that I have. He's actually a certified financial planner. He's got his master's in education. He really aligns with the ideas of the infinite banking concept with using life insurance as a savings vehicle, the way that we talk about it here. So because of the fact that I don't have a lot of understanding about how uh, the nuances of, of different options and whatnot about how whole life insurance works or how these insurance strategies work for Canadians specifically, I figured why not uh, just try to find the person who actually is out there doing it and helping people every single day who is an expert at that doing this in the Canadian space. And, uh, and so that's why Galen is here. So Galen, thanks for being here, man. Oh, thanks for having me, man. I think it's just, uh, just an awesome coincidence or a fate that brought us together to be able to jam, <laughs> totally. jam out on a similar project and similar uh, concepts in two different countries. And uh, yeah, and I'm actually, I'm originally from the States. I grew up in North Carolina. I was born in Georgia, grew up in North Carolina, moved around a bunch and ended up in Canada about 10 years ago after having lived in three other countries has nice. settled in Canada for the last 10 years. So yeah, happy to be here. That's awesome. Well, so what I would, I would love to just kind of encourage everybody to do, if, you, if you're Canadian, you're watching this, or if you know somebody who's in Canada, feel free to share it with them. Because I, what, I, what surprised me is there's not a lot of information out there on the internet uh, for Canadians specifically on this topic. There's a ton for the US. Uh, it's really limited in Canada. If you are somebody who's in Canada, I think um, not to like sell you preemptively on this, I mean, but um, I do know people are going to have questions. So I'm going to, there's going to be a link down below. If you want to have a conversation with, with uh, Galen, you are actually licensed in four provinces, right? Yes. What, I'm licensed. What, yep. Are there four provinces in Canada? This is oh, my there's, geographic. There's many more than four, but uh, yeah. So I live in Ontario. I'm a couple hours east of Toronto. So that's the yep. first province where I got licensed. But nice. a couple of years ago, I started doing nearly all of my meetings uh, digitally. Um, so I got licensed in Nova Scotia. I got licensed in BC. So BC and Ontario are the most populous of the uh, provinces. Okay. And then uh, more recently in Alberta, probably nice. on my way to get licensed in other places as well, because people just keep finding me online popping up and it's worth it to get licensed in provinces uh, that I find people in. So yeah, I'm, I'm covering, I'm covering a pretty good chunk of the uh, country so far. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, all right. So this is, this is exciting for me. So, because I've actually had a lot of questions about this myself. So um, I'm going to just kind of rip off some questions. And I know, you know, we had a little bit of a pre-discussion um, about the differences between the U S and Canada. And you kind of mentioned you don't understand the U.S. fully and I don't understand how it works in Canada fully. So I think this will be kind of fun because we, I, what I'd love to do is just kind of have a conversation around this. Um, and, 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 and I think in that conversation, it'll answer a lot of questions for a lot of the people that are watching. Um, so what I'd love to do and start with then is just kind of ask you in your understanding of the infinite banking concept, let's say, right? And um, how to use whole life insurance as a savings vehicle, as a storage account to be able to leverage for financial flexibility, financial stability, financial opportunity, like being able to do what we know you can do with it. How does that work in Canada? I'd love to hear your side first and then I can kind of chime in and like pipe in when the differences like kind of arise to me. Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, one of the things that I really look at with this with this product and a, a product and approach is, first off, I get a really good feel for what someone's up to in this world. Like, what do they want to achieve? And then we figure mm -hmm. out where does this fit in? Like, what's what's the whole puzzle, and where does this piece fit in? Mm -hmm. And 
whole life insurance reminds me a lot of growing up. I had a multi-tool. I was a boy scout and I had this thing. It was pliers and a knife and a screwdriver and all these other things. And really whole life insurance, in my opinion, is like the multi-tool, the Swiss army knife of financial mm -hmm. products, because it covers a lot of bases. Uh, it, it, it acts in a lot of different ways. Right. Mm -hmm. And so one of the big things I look at when I meet with people is taxes. Uh, you know, as a financial planner, I'm a big fan of controlling what I can control and managing what I can't control. So I can't control things like the markets, but I can help my clients manage their behavior when the markets are going crazy, right? So that's one of the biggest things I bring to the table on that side. The other thing in Canada is that our taxes, from my understanding, in some ways, our taxes are much higher than the United States, right? And so um, just as an example, so so the government gives us a couple options to put money away to get some tax benefits, right? And up here, they're called the tax-free savings account and the registered retirement savings plan. I think there's similar things in the States. Mm -hmm. Tax-free savings account, you can put away like 6,000 a year. Uh, it's a little bit more than that, but it's uh, tax-free going in, tax-free coming back out, tax-free growth. So it's good. Wait, you uh, have, it goes in tax-free, it grows tax-free and you get tax-free distribution. Correct. And tax free to the next generation. But the limit is, I think this year it's 6,500. So it's not a huge place to put money, but it ain't shabby. Like to be able to put it in and just tax free all around. Um, so that's pretty good. amazing, by the way. There's nothing like that in the United okay. States. Okay. Got it. So the the good news is is that the room is cumulative. So if someone is, uh, by, if someone was eighteen by the time this started back, and I think it was two thousand nine, I have a whole video just about the uh, this account. Um, it's added up to a bit, like it's like seventy five grand and change of room that someone would have right now. Um, and then the other option that the government gives us is the registered retirement savings plan or RRSP. And that is based on one's income. So you can put okay. up you can put up to eighteen percent of your income to a max of around twenty seven thousand dollars a year into that. You get a tax credit for putting it in. Like the money that you put in is is not counted as part of your income uh, okay. when you put it in. Right. It grows tax deferred. This is a very important word because a lot of people say it's tax free. It is not right. a tax free growth. It is tax right. deferred. You're kicking mm -hmm. the can down the road. Yep. And this is probably the most popular place for Canadians to put their money. And I'm going to talk sure. about one of the big downsides to this. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying you should cancel it, but you should yep. manage the problem that people are going to have. So, so it's tax, you get the tax deduction, money going in, tax deferred growth. When it comes out, it is completely added on to one's taxable income. Okay. So it's not bad if someone's a self-employed entrepreneur, they've got no pension, they're not going to have a lot of money in retirement, not a bad place to put your money. But one of the big things that I've seen over time is I will get in front of people in their 60s and 70s who have a million dollars in this account. And if they were to pass away while they still have a million dollars in this thing, they would lose approximately half of it to taxes, sometimes even more, like sometimes oh. even like, so I, I, I get in front of people who have like, it is the number of people who reach out to me completely shocked that this is the reality. Like I give talks around estate planning regularly. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things I bring up because the, the tax rate in Canada, okay. it goes up pretty fast. And when it comes basically in Ontario and it's similar across the provinces, but any dollar passed around 220,000, like you get to 40% really fast, mm -hmm. like way less than $220,000 and then 50% and above once you're on that 220 range. So if someone has, mm -hmm. Yeah. So if someone passes away in Canada and they've got, um, you know, principal residence is tax free. So that's good. But let's say they've got a side property that's grown in value. They got capital gains there. Let's say they were taking an income in, in, in retirement and they pass away with a million bucks inside of their RSP. Pretty much half of it's going to go to taxes every time. And wow. the vast majority of people I say this to, they say, mm, I don't think you're, I don't know. I don't believe that. I don't think you're right. And I'm like, no, I'm absolutely right. And they're just shocked that no one has ever told them this because the black and white, I call it drive through financial planning advice that they've gotten was everyone should do this. Everyone should max it out. This is all you should be doing. When in fact, so this is what I'll talk about before I, I stop, <laughs> is if people had been taking, just as an example, someone puts the money in, they get that tax credit. If they'd use that tax credit and put it into life insurance, then they'd have another stream, potential stream of income in retirement. It would be like the lifeboat if they need it, or yeah. it could be the legacy that they leave behind that when that half a million goes off to taxes, this life insurance policy could swoop in and replace that money. So their kids don't have to, you know, sometimes kids have to sell properties they don't want to sell to pay the tax bill. Right. But if they had been doing this from a life insurance standpoint, from a whole life insurance, they'd have that whole, you know, like I said, like we, that's just two of the um, 
ways of accessing the money is um, borrowing against it in retirement if you need the money and if mm-hmm. you don't need it leaving to the next generation because life insurance does pay out tax free. So it's right. a nice exemption uh, to take okay. make the most of. That's awesome. All right. So let's that that's amazing. So first of all, what, what you just said to me makes me believe and think that life insurance is even more important in Canada than it is in the United States, like a whole life insurance policy because because of the tax ramifications and the, it seems like there's less flexibility inside what we would call a qualified account. Like a, that's the, that's your RRSP is the equivalent of like our 401k. And yeah, it I sounds like so. we have, we have a couple different options. Like we have IRAs, which, yep. you know, um, there there's all sorts of different kind of qualified accounts, depending on what type of business you have or whatever. So I think the United States m- makes it a little more complicated than Canada does. Um, Yet the ability to navigate the tax ramifications are a little more flexible in the United States, um, which makes it even more important in Canada to, to make sure that you protect it against that because your options are fewer. Oh, absolutely. There's a blogger in the States. He's big among doctors, among physicians, yeah. yep. and I'm on his email list. And um, one day I got this email and it was all about, he had, he had done some research on Canadian financial planning. He threw a yep. few things in there and I went back to him just kind of clarifying a few points he had put in there. And one of the things that really shocked me as I was following him, because mm-hmm. overall he's like, he thinks, you know, in his estimation, whole life insurance is not, as, it shouldn't be as common as it is. And one of the reasons he said is that in the States, at least in his blog, this is what he's saying mm-hmm. is most doctors won't have uh, tax, estate taxes. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't know anyone in Canada who won't have estate taxes. Like sure. I, everyone I know practically will have estate taxes and doctors will typically have a lot. If they've had to save up a whole bunch of money to sure. then like create their own pension, which I help them do, they're mm-hmm. going to have a whole bunch of money saved up in places where it is not sheltered from tax. And so I said this to him and he wrote, he wrote sort of a addendum in his following post. And he's like, yeah, Galen from Canada got in touch with me. And he's like, it is a different world up there when it comes to, uh, to, to estate taxes. And because my understanding in the States, and I don't know very well, but it seems like you have to get pretty high before you have to worry a lot about like those big, like 50%. I don't know, but um, you hit 40% fast in Canada. So basically what I say to people, this is what I say to people. So the RSB, arguably the most popular place for Canadians to put their money. It's Mm -hmm. where most Canadians have their savings. Mm -hmm. I sit down in front of someone and I say, look, would you invest your money such that you could lose 50% of it in one day? And people are like, no, I would never take that risk in the market. People are like, maybe 10%, you know, 2020 was a crazy year. Maybe I lost like 10% a day, maybe 20, but like 50, I would never put my money somewhere where I'd lose 50% in the market. And I'm like, but that is, that is what you're doing when you do an RSP. Like if it sits in there long enough and gets big enough, half of it is gone in an instant to taxes. If you pass away. When you pass away, it goes, yeah. And it passes to a spouse. So like one thing I'll say, it does spouse, it does pass to the spouse tax uh, free or tax deferred again, it rolls over. Um, mm-hmm. There are a few exemptions when it comes to like um, uh, if you're taking care of a disabled child or grandchild, but they're very rare exceptions to that rule. And yeah. consistently, when I sit in front of people for this, and and I mean, I, I, I really work my way backwards. Like I meet a lot of people in the 60s and in their 60s and 70s for whom it's a little bit late to solve the problem completely. We yeah. can do some work. Like basically, I call the RSP is what I call a red bucket. It's a red bucket because it's completely taxable. Mm-hmm. We move them bit by bit over to the green buckets, which are life insurance, tax-free savings account, and some stuff in like the yellow bucket that I call, which is more of like the capital gain side of things. But mm-hmm. I, that's why I work with retirees on is slowly moving things strategically from one bucket to the other, such that if all goes well, it's all green by the time they pass away. Mm-hmm. Or young people kind of opening their eyes to this issue of like, it may not seem like an issue now, but it is going to be an issue down the line. And not only could life insurance help take care of that issue, but even if you live long enough such that it's not as big of an issue, like you've been able to drain that account a bit, you've got an extra source of income if you need it, or you've got more flexibility, or you've got a much bigger legacy to your children or grandchildren or charity or right. church. That's awesome. So let's get a little technical um, right now, because I'm kind of curious about this myself. Um, when it comes to loan provisions inside of a whole life policy. How does that work? Because in the United States, you're not actually taking a loan from your policy, right? You're, you're taking a loan against your policy. So your policy is used as collateral. The life insurance company then gives you a side loan, leveraging your policy for that direct access and guaranteed access to cash. But that never interrupts the compounding of the growth inside of the policy, right? So your money's growing. So I always kind of tell people you can get a loan if you had a hundred grand in your policy, 
you could take a hundred thousand dollar loan. Let's say you're paying a 5% loan rate on it. But if the dividend you're making in your policy is earning 5%, you have a, a an amortizing loan, which means you're paying less and less interest every month. And you have an, uh, your policy is never interrupting the compounding. So it's growing at a faster and faster rate. So like, is that the same way it works in Canada? It sounds very similar. Um, yeah. yeah. So you have the option in Canada either to borrow against the policy using the same life insurance company that you used to put the policy that will interrupt it. But if you basically life insurance companies in Canada are not allowed to do, we call it a collateralized loan where you use the um, cash value of the life insurance as collateral for a loan. So it's very similar to what you're saying. Okay. It just sounds like there's a bit of an extra step in there where if you want to borrow against the policy in a way that does not affect the growth, you do what's called a collateral loan. Uh, with the kinds of policies I put into place, you're allowed to borrow up to 90% of the uh, cash value. Okay. And the, the rest is allowed, just like you said, the rest is allowed to keep compounding. It's like, and I mean, and one of the big things I say to people is where else can you do this? Like, mm -hmm. where can you access your money without actually taking it out of the market or taking it out of investing? I'd say the only thing that's even remotely similar is like a home equity line of credit, where in theory, mm -hmm. your home is growing, growing in value. But the beauty of life insurance policy is you don't live in your life insurance policy. Like sure. you're not putting you're not putting your home on the line when you do this. So it sounds pretty similar. It sounds like there might be an extra step in there just because um, the the companies themselves are not allowed to collateralize their own policies. But banks banks love it when people do this. Like banks will put yeah. out promotional materials to be like use our bank for this because really. What, so that's a separate industry almost in Canada. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely, yeah, it's, 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 like a, it's a own side industry, like a parallel. Yeah. Industry. Yeah. It's a parallel I'd say. And banks love it because they're like, what is more reliable? What is more stable as far as collateral goes than the cash value of a life insurance policy no. from a company that's been doing this since the 1840s from a company that's never missed a dividend payment in the history of the policy through yeah, it doesn't world wars, depressions. Like, yeah, I mean, so banks that understand it are like, yeah, like we could not ask for better collateral yeah. than this. Yeah, no, that's amazing. So, so what are the typical, what you're seeing? Um, and I know if it's anything like the US, the rates fluctuate, but what are you seeing right now in 2021 at the beginning of 2021 here? What are the, the, like the loan rates typically and what are typical dividend rates uh, in whole life policies right now? Yeah, dividend rates, um, I'd have to double check right now because I know a different companies have come out with their numbers recently. Different companies have different year ends, right? Uh, but usually in the 6% range on the dividend scale. Okay. And then, um, yeah, loans are around 5%, okay. I'd say. So you can actually, in that percent, in that instance, you're actually, if you're taking that loan and you're not, um, and, and, and you're, you're taking a loan at five and you're earning a 6% dividend versus paying cash for something and you use this strategy the right way, you, you can actually make out really, really well. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, a, it's definitely a strategy. Once people understand it, they like I've had clients who put these in place and uh -huh. then five years later, they're like, so can I do it again? <laughs> you know, or like, can I do more of this or can I set this up for my kids? Yeah. Or I told my brother about this, like he's going to come talk to you. And what I'll say where there's an even bigger win or potentially like, I mean, I have these, pol like I have the, I do this myself. Like I have, um, I put about 10% of what I make every year inside of a cash value life insurance policy for a long, for me, it's long-term access. I'm not accessing in the short term personally, uh, but I'm using it more, like I said, of my uh, lifeboat and legacy uh, bucket, so to speak. Um, but um the other place where it comes in is corporate planning. Um, in Canada, a corp I, I work with a lot of physicians, business owners who have corporations. Yep. Um, corporations in Canada, um, I don't know what it's like in the States, but our, uh, the, our version of the IRS is called the CRA, the Can Canada Revenue Agency. Um, okay. They are very good at spotting loopholes, very good at spotting places where people are trying to you know, shelter money from taxes. So corporations are a great place to save taxes in general. But there are a lot of limitations on how much how much um, corp how much uh, passive income a corporation can make. You know, then you start losing some of the tax benefits of having a corporation. Like they've really tightened down things. But whole life insurance inside of a corporation, because whole life insurance falls under a completely different tax act and tax code. Like life insurance has been around in Canada since before income taxes were like, it's been around. I don't think income taxes came in until about 50 years after companies started doing whole life insurance. So it's a whole different right. set of rules. It's very well protected over on its side. It's not part of what's called the bank act. It has its own act. Um, so it's still something that corporations can hold as a way to build tax advantaged 
value inside of the corporation, either for short term or long term. Okay. And a lot of those borrowing strategies still work really well um, with the corporation. It's and it's even it's a bonus because you are using corporate dollars to mm. fund the policy. So you're 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 instead of paying, you know, fifty percent. Like instead of paying, you know, earning, having to earn a dollar to then put 50 cents into this, you're only having to earn uh, like 65 cents to put 50 cents into this. Like your tax rates are much more favorable. Gotcha. That's awesome. Wow. That's, that's crazy. So let, let me ask you this, like what a lot of people in the United States kind of say, well, that's a great strategy, but it's only, it's only good for the wealthy, right? Like it only makes sense if you're making a ton of money um, where I would, I would argue that you know, adamantly that, that that's not the case, but it sounds like in Canada, that's even, even more the case where it, it's, this is kind of a strategy, no matter where you are, if you're just starting your career, if you're later along, like if you're making a ton of money or just kind of getting going, this should be kind of part of your plan, no matter what. Yeah. And definitely one of the things I look at is, you know, if someone's not ready to start it, typically what I'll do is we'll look at, okay, how much life insurance do you need period? Like with or without this strategy. So young person, like, so in my example, if I were, if something were to happen to me, I'd want to make sure that my wife doesn't have to sell the house. I'd want to make sure she doesn't have to get a crummy job to like make ends meet, get send mm -hmm. the kids to school. So I have a boatload of term life insurance, right? If anything happens to me, all this money is going to flow in and my wife's just going to have options galore in her life. Um, so I do. So sometimes careful. what I, be what's careful. that? You better be careful. Yeah. yeah. One, <laughs> one, eye, one eye open, uh, sleep with one eye open. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so there's that. And then, so what I do for people is I say, wait, let, let, let's look at the total need. Yeah. Looking at it first with that multi-tool, the multi-tool yeah. of life insurance. Okay. What do you need? Yeah. Then I work my way backwards and I'm like, how much are you likely going to need for the rest of your life? Not just this temporary need of kids are young. Uh, you know, I'm young in my career. Like what's the total need going to be? And we're like, how soon can we convert some of that term insurance to the whole life insurance? And so I like to lock that in because I think one of the people, like I've had people come to me who wanted to do this strategy mm -hmm. and they couldn't qualify because of health mm -hmm. issues or something. They couldn't qualify for the best product anymore because yeah. the company is like, yeah, you know what? You've had a weird MRI sorry, we can't touch you, that sort of thing. And so what I think, what I ask, what I encourage people to think about any of these things is like, basically, this is what I think about it. When someone's born, this, this is like my vision of it. When I was born, an insurance company wrote my name on an envelope and said, we've set this aside for Galen. He can come and access this life insurance, critical illness, whatever, mm -hmm. if he applies for it, if his parents apply for it, if they give us some money, he will have access to this. Mm -hmm. If at any point in my life I had gone to the doctor and I'd had a weird MRI or a weird EKG or a weird CAT scan, the insurance companies would tear that up and yep. say, yeah, this is no longer an option for you. Right. So, and I've met people who come to me and they're like, Galen, you know, I, I, you know, late in life. And they're like, holy cow, I'm starting to realize I'm going to have all these issues or I, I would have loved to have done this. Or my friends told me about this and we start doing, going through their history. And it's like, yeah, I'm sorry. Like there's, there's no, no one's going to, no one's going to help you with this. So yeah. not the end of the world, but it's a bummer. It's a bummer to not have access to this. It's like that multi-tool, like if one side of it was glued shut and you couldn't get at it, like, yeah, you want to, like, <laughs> if you want to um, open a can and all you've got is the blade, it's a pain. You're probably going to cut yourself. <laughs> But if you've got the can opener side, it's there. So mm -hmm. that's why. So that's what I love doing is I will lock in this concept for children. I mean, like my kids, I have some for them, but I've also locked in their ability to get way more later on in life. Because if my hunch is correct, when my kids are my age, they will probably be paying even more taxes than I am. That's my hunch because they don't seem to go down. <laughs> so the trend of the world right now. Taxes yeah. So. Yeah. So I don't think, I don't think it's going to get any easier for them than it was for me. So I lock this in. That's a big, so you're asking about all stages of life. Absolutely. At a bare minimum, locking in the availability to access that envelope later on in life, bare minimum. And then beyond that, looking at, does it make sense to start somewhere with this? Uh, because the other beauty of it is it is, it does for me help fulfill a bit of a forced savings component. Like that's how I've used it for myself. Mm -hmm. Depends on every person, how I want to use it. But I know every year I've got to make that premium, like, you know, in the way that I've structured mine and they can be structured differently. But I'm, again, it's just another box that it ticks in the world of financial planning that can be very uh, helpful. That's awesome. So explain to me, how does the conversion ability in um, Canada work? In the United States, um, you have to make sure that when you buy a term policy, that you have to be really careful about the company that you buy the policy with for term insurance, because it's got to be convertible 
with that company. And you actually have to look at the terms of the contract to see what the term is convertible to. So sometimes the, 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 the term policy is only convertible for a certain period of time. If like, if you get a 10 year term, it's only convertible for the first eight years. Sometimes it's a full 10 years. Sometimes if you get a 20 year contract, it's only convertible for 15 years or up to a certain age or a certain percentage of the contract or like, you know, the, or it's only convertible to maybe a universal life ch chassis or an IUL chassis versus a whole life chat. Like you, there's all these, like not all convertible term is created equally in the United States. Um, so you gotta be really careful about, you know, and discerning and, and just like really on your game about what companies you're going with. So how did it, how, how is that in Canada? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I, so my, so the companies I use, um, they're, they're in the business of term and whole life. Like that is what they do. And they are happy when people convert from term to whole life. Like they're, they're fine with it. It's like, yes, this is an awesome thing that we have. So what I'll say is there may be companies out there that have those limitations. So I would encourage people to be careful because the companies I do use do not have the limitations that I'm hearing uh, from you. So what I'll say is, so I have access to a lot of different companies. So if someone comes to me and it's, it has happened where someone has already gotten a boatload of whole life with me yeah. and they come to me and they're like, Hey Galen, um, I'm about to have another kid. I want to redo my term insurance. And they're like, I, we, and I look at their plan. I'm like, yeah, I think you have enough of the whole life. Let's get the kind of insurance that you don't even have. You, you won't be able to convert down the road, but it's not a problem anymore. So I use that kind. If there's any chance that this person's going to want access to that envelope of whole life later on, I will use a company that is in the business of term and whole life and has never left the in the the um that product. Like some, I'm not going to name names for anything here because I just don't want to. But yeah. there are companies. Yeah. So if anyone talks to me, I can tell them which companies. Yeah, yeah. So the company that I like using is the one that has been doing it the longest, had never left. Like they've just kept doing it since the 1840s. Mm -hmm the largest account in Canada, that their account is actually bigger than all the other accounts combined. Because nice. not to go into too much detail, but whole life, when you invest in it, there's a whole pooled account of everyone who's participating in it. This company yeah. has the largest one. It's bigger than all the other ones combined. There's another company that left for a while and then came back to it. And mm -hmm. if you look really closely at the way it's structured, people who've come in at different lot times are treated differently under the contract. So that's like, I don't like that. And I'm contracted with all these companies. Like I can choose. And then there's other ones that maybe have a higher dividend scale, but then I look at why. And it's like, oh, they were really big into kid policies for a really long time. So they haven't had to pay out a lot of policies and that's not going to keep up forever. So just things sure. like that, that I dig deep on when I'm setting it up for people. So yeah, for sure. When I set up for someone, I look at it and I'm like, if you need if you need this whole life insurance when you're 30 or 60, like we're going to set it up so that you have it available to get when you need it. Mm, okay. So talk to me kind of switching topics a little bit. Does Canada have index universal life like we have in the United States? So we definitely have universal life. I'm not sure the index word, what that adds to it or not, but we have universal life where you, there's, um, you know, there's the, uh, what is it, more flexibility around the investment component. Okay. Um, what I will say with that is a lot of people, uh, let's say, how do I put this? A lot of people regret taking on those types of policies as, as compared yep. to whole life policies, especially back when interest rates were through the roof and it's like, or, or markets were super strong for longer periods of time, like different variables that made it seem like a much better option. The other problem is a lot of people, when they set these up, they, they minimum funded them, like they put as little in as possible. That came back to bite them sort of thing. So yep. at the end of the day, and when you go to collateralize in Canada, if you use universal life, you're only allowed to access 50% of it as cash value because mm, that's a big the, the banks the banks say, we know how these work. We know that it doesn't have the same guarantees as whole life because with whole life in Canada, you've got a guaranteed component of growth every year and a dividend component of growth every year. The, the cash value is vested at the end of the year. I don't know if that happens in the States or not, but that cash value moves over is kind of like your new floor for future growth. So it has just a whack load of guarantees around it that yeah, universal yeah. life does not have. So it's very like I, I will. So my specialists that I work with every once in a while, I'll be working on a case and they'll be like, hey, Galen, have you looked at universal life. And I'm like, nope, <laughs> but they'll, they'll, they'll run the numbers because you never know, right? Like yeah, it, sure, sure. It, it, it could make sense, but to date, I have yet to put in a universal life policy for anyone because I just look at the pros and the cons. And I'm like, you know what? I feel like, like if someone wants to, it's, it's a red flag for me. If someone's like, Oh yeah, I'm going to get this, but I want to tinker with it. Or I'm going to get mm -hmm. this, but I want to control the investment portion. I'm like, no, the yeah. beauty of the whole life is that you've got a $41 billion fund 
that is loaning money to things like hospitals and airports and green energy, you know, uh, solar farms, like they're loaning massive amounts of money to these projects and getting a very good rate of return on the loan. Yeah, just yeah. that, like, that's why I, and that's why I really, and I'm a, I'm a huge nerd around these products. Like I've met with the people who design them. Yep. I dig deep into the financial statements every year. Like this is not something I have lightly put into place in the lives of my clients or myself. Yep. And, and I understand all the people out there that talk about the downsides of it. And I'm happy to talk about like, you know, when people say that, like, oh, like, you know, this doesn't work the way you say it is like, I'm happy to very much elucidate the pros and the cons and the limitations and the access. But at the end of the day, just to get back to the to the universal life question is to date, I have not put one in place because I have not seen where it was a better idea for my client than straight up whole life or investing in term, you know, like there's different combinations of things that will achieve what they think they're going to achieve with universal mm -hmm. life that I have yet to see by actually putting universal life into place. No, that's, that's actually phenomenal to hear. It's, it's, and it's actually, um, it makes me believe a little more in the universal life in a way, because that 50% access protects the people with the policy. And mm -hmm. it, 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 I like how it, it, that rule kind of disables unscrupulous agents to go out there and sell it inappropriately. Right. Yeah. It's kind of a, a it's a consumer protection um, rule that I think is a really healthy thing that we don't have in the United States. Mm. And we have a lot of a lot oh. of agents in the United States going out and selling IUL policies and UL policies. And I'll explain the IUL for you in a second. But where you can have the access to the cash collateraliz collateralization of the policy uh, directly through the insurance companies the way we do it in the United States, mm. um, but full like access to the same way that you would in a whole life policy. But then what happens, as you know, is in a UL policy, as you get all the expenses go up, if they're not funded properly, if you, if you borrow money against it improperly, like it can really, really come to bite you very quickly. And when, especially if the market turns down, if the market's going great constantly, phenomenal. Like, I mean, I, I get a lot of people telling me, you're an idiot, Chris. Like IUL policies are great. UL policies are great because look how they perform. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. But like, what happens if you bought one in 2000 and you needed it in 2009? That's not great, right? Like, it's great that we've been on this like 11 year bull market run. And, and you know, like, it feels like everybody kind of feels bulletproof right now, but that's not the reality of the world that we live in. You know, like at some point in time, people are going to get burned by this. And I mean, I, I don't wish that on anybody, but at the same time, uh, you know, I, I, I just can't wait to. <laughs> because well, well, from a philosophical standpoint, I mean, I have a very strong belief system that has been forged by years of working with clients, by years of exploring options. Like I am meticulous when it comes to planning. Like it, it is not uncommon for me to run 20 different scenarios, 30 different scenarios for a client before we decide on one. And I talk to my other, I talk to my colleagues, I talk to my specialist, I get other eyes on it to make sure I'm doing it right. And part of me staying on top of those things is to talk a little bit about design and advisor, um, let's say, uh, compensation is yeah. in Canada, there is a there is a button I can click when I run a whole life policy that can either put as much money into the cash as possible or as little into the cash as possible. It's called additional deposit option. It's called different things for different companies. Yeah. But most people that I get in front of say, look, I would love the flexibility of either paying for this for the rest of my life or only paying for it for like 10 years mm -hmm. and maxing out the cash growth. Like that's usually what people tell me. And they're like, sure. this is what I want. Like it all makes sense. Like it's kind of a win, win, win. Yeah. It makes sense. Pull back the curtain a little bit. My commission gets hammered when I do that because less <laughs> money is going. I was just going to ask you that. <laughs> oh, it gets, it gets hammered. And it, and it was much, basically. Like 90% lower? Uh, no, it, it's about 50 to 60% lower okay. probably. All right. Yeah. In the United yeah, States, yeah. it's worse than that. If, if yeah. you structure a whole life policy properly in the U.S., you're yeah. taking an 85 to 90 percent pay cut. Yeah, yeah. So, and a lot of advisors either don't know it's an option, they don't like the option. Like, yeah. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna speculate as to what people are thinking when they don't do that. But I will say that very early on, I was working with specialists, and so back in Canada in 2017, some legislation came out about life insurance um, that changed a little bit of like how much it's allowed to grow to still be considered life insurance. But the beauty of it is, is the government worked with the the companies. And they're like, let's figure out a way to still stay on sides, but still benefit the consumer. Mm -hmm. So it's still, it's actually, I would argue the way that they're being structured properly now is probably even better than the way they were structured in 2016. If, if you're clicking that button 
And it's a, it's literally like, so people, and this is the other thing I'll say is like, when I hear people talk about things, they, they, they make it sound like it's this magical thing of like, oh, I've got a properly structure. And like, yes, for me, the biggest thing is to make sure it's right for the client. Like that's where I spend most of my time. Once sure. I figure out what's right for the client, I build it nine times out of 10, I'm clicking that button mm. and then I can just watch the numbers change. Like this is how much of the premium is going towards life. This is how much is going yeah. towards cash value. Boom. Yeah. I click it almost every time. And yeah, my commission gets hit by it, but it's the right thing to do. And I've heard other people argue why I shouldn't do that. And I've yet to find a real reason why not to do it in most cases. And um, just as an example, I was working on a case a bit ago with a doctor. If he were to use this as a supplement to retirement income, he'd basically be able to retire four years sooner by me clicking this button than not clicking this button. So I'm like, in what world can I justify this guy working four extra years just because I wanted to make the full commission on this thing. Like I cannot justify that in my world. So yeah, I click the button nine times out of 10. A lot of advisors don't even know the button exists. Um, you know, they just, they just haven't gotten used to it. But back in 2017, as, the, as the things started changing from a, from a rules and tax perspective, I started digging deep into how can these still be at least as good as they used to be, if not better. Yeah, no, I mean, the one thing I always kind of tell people because life insurance, I mean, the United States is very much the same way as Canada in the sense that these life insurance companies have been around forever. Like in the United States, we have this thing called the civil war that happened in the 1860s, right? Like when Abraham Lincoln was president. And I just remember when I first started working with my company, uh, when I first got into the life insurance industry and uh, you know, they, they were started in, in 1848, right? Like, yeah. and I'm just like, holy crap, that was 14 years before the civil war, 13 years before the civil war, like before Lincoln was president, before any of that was happening to think that this company has, you know, was created and stayed in existence and like made it through the civil war, like in all these things that happened, if they have the, a financial strategy that can like get through all of that, like, a, that's that, that just says that, that I need to have a part that needs to be part of what I'm doing. First of all, secondly, like, when, when there's a lot of people that are talking about uh, the fact that governments are going to come after all the advantages and benefits of having life insurance, the one thing that people have to understand is that politics are people, right? Like politicians are the ones who create these rules. And so guess what? Politicians are typically the wealthy. It's, no, you know, being a politician no longer is being a public servant anymore. It's all about power. It's all about control. It's all about status. It's all about con like all these things. And so like all of these politicians are utilizing this product. You know, all these banks own this product. All these companies own this product. All these elite people and lobbyists use this tool. They're not going to do anything that's going to hurt themselves. Period. So why would you not want to take advantage of being part of a financial using a tool and a strategy and getting involved in a pool of people that are doing this? It's obviously working and op it's like a place that you know you can protect yourself and and in and ensure a certain outcome. Yeah, and I love that you put that historical perspective to it because I have not done that before, but in Canada, it might even, it might be as least as interesting that Canada became a country in 1850 and oh. whole life started in Canada in the early 1840s. So <laughs> even yeah. before Canada, and then the tax rules didn't come in until much later. And you're absolutely right, same thing in Canada. I mean, um, the stat that I've heard is eight out of 10 of the wealthiest families in Canada use this Mark. strategy with my company. Like the other two, oh, pro the other 20% of the eight, you probably use someone else, right? But 80%. Uh, and so like, and who are the people just like you said, like to pull the curtain back just a little bit, like yeah. who's making the rules, who's behind the scenes um, benefiting or hurt, getting hurt by different rule changes. Like this would be, this would be a massive thing for someone to try to go after. It would be, yeah. I don't know, like, I don't, I don't talk politics too much, but it would probably be political suicide for someone to go too heavily after this, because a lot of people would be like, uh, isn't that that thing that my advisor set up for me like 20 years ago for me, my kids, my grandparents, my da da da, and be like, yeah, that's the thing. Okay, cat, well, no, we're not going to let that happen. Like someone tried to, um, actually, it was not too long ago in, um, I can't remember if it was Alberta or Saskatchewan, they tried to put um, uh, tax income, um, sales tax on premiums for insurance. Mm. And it got it got knocked down, like ah. it got it, it got somewhere, but then it got hit. Because as always, the way that they justify it is they say, this will be an extra X million of dollars that we can oh, then sure. do for this, instead of becoming more accountable. And like, I'll stop there with the 
the, the, the government thing, but instead of becoming more accountable how the, how how they're spending the money that they already have, it's yeah. more of a oh, if we just added this little tax onto this new thing, we'd have an extra million bucks that we'd of course put into healthcare or whatever. So, yeah. anyways, um, yeah, people people tend not to want to mess with this too much, and when they do, they actually the good thing is like back in 2017, we had a lot of. Um, quote unquote warning. I mean, like we knew it was coming for years mm -hmm. and a lot of people freaked out. Oh my God, it's not going to be a good thing anymore. But yeah. like in the eighties, they messed, they messed with it a little bit. Yeah. Like in 82, I think was the, the, the last time before 2017, they kind of tinkered with it. There's probably a time before that too, that I don't know about. Right. And it still made sense. Like it's still in the eighties, they tinkered with it, still made sense. Yep. 2017, they tinkered with it. Like mm -hmm. I said, the companies figured out, okay, if, if the advisor knows his stuff, he can click this button and it's still at least as good as ever. So we're going to keep doing this. Yeah. That's interesting. Like the, the correlation between the United States and Canada when they kind of mess with these things. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I don't know how long, how long you guys have had the RRSP and all these tax-free plans and all that stuff, but like uh, so good. Yeah, yeah. the 401k wasn't created in the United States until 1979 and didn't go like into actual circulation until uh, until like 1981, 82, okay. when, when it was more commonly used. Um, and, yeah, yeah. So, you know, at that time, because they were trying to like reposition and shift and push people's money into the markets through these qualified plans mm -hmm. when that really started taking mm -hmm. off, they were like, whoa, we have this whole life thing going on. And so they changed all the mech limits and they used Tamara and Defra and they did all these different things that kind of came into play to, to manipulate how much or change how much people could actually dump in to whole life policies and keep the tax benefits yet even after they still did that it still made sense right so but it's funny that was like 1981 1982 in the united yeah, 82 States. is when they did it here yeah so that just goes to show like the world political movement and all that stuff not getting into the details of it but like it's it, that's kind of funny to me um yeah well that's awesome well i tell you what um we could talk about this stuff for hours and hours and hours and i'm sure we will we're going to do a whole playlist of this stuff so I wanted this video just to be kind of like an introductory, like just getting the overall understanding. I know a lot of people in Canada, based on the feedback that I've gotten on the channel, watch a lot of United States content, right? They, they watch a lot of stuff on the concepts of whole life insurance because I think they know that it exists in Canada, um, but there's not a lot of information. So they wind up learning about the US and hoping that it's kind of similar. Um, my deduction from our conversation today is that it's actually better in Canada, um, that, um, the, the need at least to have it, to utilize a strategy is, is even more in Canada. Um, and so what I think will be awesome, Galen, if you're up for it, is I'd love to do a, like a Canadian playlist, like a series on this channel, um, to serve people and to be able to, um, you know, just provide education, uh, to, to just you know, give people an opportunity. If, if you're somebody in Canada who's interested in reaching out um, and connecting with Galen or even myself, I mean, I don't, I don't know how much I can help you, honestly, if you're in Canada, um, just full transparency on, on at the same time. Um, because if you're have watched my channel, you know this already. Uh, but if you're a Canadian, and you're kind of stumbling on this. Um, I uh, was at one point in time, a fully licensed financial advisor. I actually gave up my licenses uh, just to focus on the financial education of it because I'm super passionate about helping entrepreneurs. My company, Life 180, what we do is we help entrepreneurs build their businesses online. And I, I'm a big believer that uh, your, like, your personal financial situation is the lifeblood. It's the oxygen to everything that you do. And if you don't get your financial house in order and have the right financial strategies for your company uh, and for your personal life, that uh, eventually everything's going to blow up on you. I, I saw it so many times as an advisor and I see it as I'm coaching people as entrepreneurs. If you don't have your financial house in order, it's just a matter of time before everything kind of implodes on you. And, you know, it's like building a castle on sand, so to speak. And so we want to make sure that, you know, you build a, a, a financial uh, foundation on granite, you know, and that's, that's kind of what this is all about. And so um, that's what I do. And that's why I do these videos is I love serving entrepreneurs. Uh, and so, um, if you are interested though, uh, in, in hearing more information about this, make sure you hit the subscribe button, make sure you click the bell that way you get notified. Cause I think Galen and I are going to do more of these videos, uh, to be able to answer more of the questions that are specifically for Canadians. What I would also encourage is if you have any questions in regards to specific Canadian, um, 
strategies, uh, regulations, taxes, guidelines, like anything that would kind of come in to your personal financial world, um, go ahead and type it in the comments. I'm really dil diligent about making sure I respond to every single comment as much as possible. Um, and if I see it, I will make sure that Galen and I put it on the docket and we will do a video answering your question specifically for you. Because if you have the question, chances are a thousand other people have the same question uh, and we will go from there. But uh, so I hope, I hope um, you know, you found value in this video. If you do want to have a conversation with Galen specifically, go ahead and look below. There's going to be a link below where you can actually just click on there and set up a free consultation. Do Just kind of do an exploratory call uh, with Galen. I understand there's a lot of people that, um, you know, are in different positions, have different needs, different desires, different curiosities, different objectives that they're looking to achieve. And so, you know, a, a quick 15, 20 minute call with Galen just to kind of get a, a better understanding, maybe a little more clarity can go a long ways. Uh, maybe he can help you, maybe he can't, but it never hurts to have that conversation. Um, and, I, and I think that that uh, would hopefully be able to serve people and add value. So uh, Galen, anything else you want to say before we end this one? And we'll see him on the next video. Oh man, yeah, no, it's awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Definitely click that link if you have any more questions, if you want to schedule a quick call. And yeah, I look forward to the future videos uh, for sure. Beautiful. All right, guys, until next time, have a blessed, inspirational day. We'll see you then.